I find it hard to pick my favorite guest among the people that I've had on because I've dealt with a lot of really, really talented people. Uh, there are, are some shows that really stick out in my mind as, as being especially good just because not so much they were uh, particularly better shows, so to speak, but they were a little bit more innovative and, and sort of game changers for me. Uh, one of the ones was Law. That was the first musician that I had on. He was a hip-hop artist from from uh, Brooklyn who approached me. And uh, he said, look, i got a story I'd like to tell you. And I worked with George Clinton and a whole bunch of other people. And, you know, I'm in the process of making a, a bit of a comeback, and I'm doing all these shows. Would you be willing to talk to me? I said, why not? You know, and I, I put him on. Turned out to he brought a whole big pile of fans with him. Uh, it was one of the single most active chat rooms that I've ever had. Really nice guy, and you know, opened up the book and talked about everything, and and you know where he'd come from and where he wanted to go, and and that was a really good show. Uh, another one that that I had on uh, that was a really big game changer was Rob Goki, who was a composer from uh, California, and um, Rob really was the guy that first showed me the ropes at, in terms of Twitter. And uh, I didn't really know much about it as a tool, but he said, look, I've got this book that I've written called In the Belly of the Fail Whale that sort of describes his first year on Twitter and building up a business and getting referrals. Uh, you know, why don't you take a look at it? It was a nice, easy, fast read, and I'd recommend it to anybody that is thinking about starting up a, sort of a networking on Twitter. And I applied some of the plays, and all of a sudden my Twitter account started to go up exponentially, and I said, you know, this is unbelievable. I, I didn't realize that this was even possible. So I had him on, and, and we were talking about his composing work and, and some of the other people that he'd worked with that ultimately I wound up having on the show, people like Angelo Bell and, uh, uh, you know, King is a Fink and all these other people that, that were just great people. And uh, uh, so there's there's a few of them that stick out like that. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. I actually I had just one on uh, just before Christmas, uh, Guy Magar. And, you know, that was a really, really fun show. I, I love reading memoirs about film and things like that. And he sent me a copy of his book called Kiss Me Quick Before I Shoot. Uh, this was a guy who directed episodes of The A-Team and Hunter and, and wrote this really, really, really unbelievable memoir about his journey and you know where he'd come from. Totally addictive. I could not put the thing down. And I, I had a lot of fun talking to him. So that was probably my best show of last year. Uh, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, would it, like who who would be um, who would be somebody that you maybe have have been trying to get on, or who would who would be your dream to have on? There's a few of them that I, I would like to have on. Uh, one of the guys actually just followed me recently, and you probably don't know who he is, but I'll, I'll throw this out there anyway because he was really sort of my inspiration in terms of a talk show host, and he epitomizes uh, you know, what I think it means to be a good talk show host in terms of interviewing entertainment people. Uh, there's a guy up in Canada who runs a show out of Toronto, the Canadian talk show, I think, in terms of entertainment. His name is George Strombolopoulos. And you can find him on Twitter at Strombo, S-T-R-O-M-B-O. And I would stack him up against any talk show host I've ever seen, and I'm including people like Larry King in that bunch. Really, you know, he, he's got an infectious enthusiasm, uh, obviously really enjoys what he's doing, and he has all these really cool people on. He's got the biggest names in the business wind up going on his show, and, and uh, my wife and I are both huge fans of his. Uh, so he he would be somebody that I would really love to have on at some point if he'd be willing to give me a few minutes. Uh, and again, he just started following me within the last couple of weeks, so that was a big thrill when I saw that happen. Uh, there's a couple of other filmmakers that that uh, I, I would really like to have on. People like Norman Jewison, who's one of my favorite filmmakers of all time, and uh, also a Canadian, but uh, uh, you know, has made some of the biggest. Uh, you know, most important American films ever made. So, uh, and some of the actors, I, I could go through a list of my my favorite actors. People like Michael Caine and and uh, Stephen Fry. I'd like to have on. I know that he's big on Twitter. Uh, you know, I mean, who wouldn't you want to talk to, really? <laughs> did you ever see that uh, interview with Michael Caine that he did on? Uh, God, what was it? Um, God, what's that? What's that TV show on uh, with uh, James Lipton? Oh, Inside the Actor Studio. You ever see his episode of that? No, I didn't see that. And, but, and I'm a big fan of James Lipton's too. And I, I, I would love to hear what his favorite curse word is. <laughs> I can't remember what it is, but like, I mean, get on YouTube and, and check it out. It is one of the most like heartbreaking like episodes because uh, he tells this like like really sad story about like how his 
father died and like didn't have like any money to his name like he he didn't own anything like the the one kind of thing that he had was like uh like a little radio that he rented for like like a dollar a day or something you know crazy like that but it was like the most heartbreaking like interview like I've ever seen on that show so yeah he would be he would be cool to have on I think that would be that would be awesome uh this is something that I wanted to talk to you about because during our uh, our back and forth, you know, through email, um, this is something that has has been going on for the past. Well, I mean, it's been going on since I guess you know November. A lot of the you know talk about it and people coming out about it. But this past week was you know the 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 SOPA uh, blackouts. Of course, uh, Google and uh, Wikipedia and, and stuff like that. And uh, for for you guys that that don't know, like SOPA is uh, it's 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 in the guise of preventing piracy, but it's 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 really it would pretty much end the internet, and it could possibly even go to. I know it would probably even affect you know it would affect podcasts. It would definitely maybe even affect you know the cutting room floor or even horror quest or even you know our festival's website, of course uh, YouTube and stuff like that. And uh, it's been something that's kind of divided uh, even the, the Horror Quest audience because uh, through talking to some of the people on you know, Facebook and stuff like that, it seems to be um, something that even the filmmakers are kind of, some of them think it's a good idea, whereas the other people don't. And uh, I know that you talk to a lot of filmmakers, and I would assume that you have an opinion on this, so this is you know why I pose the question. Uh, like, what do you think about the the SOPA and uh, PIPA uh, legislation that actually just got? Uh, I guess they're pushing back the vote on it. I guess they, you know, kind of got scared off a little bit. But uh, what do you think about that? And then what do you think about like piracy in general? Where do you stand on it? Because I know, of course, the people in you know media, as I w- you know, I would include you in that, even though you know it's not your day job, as you say. Uh, I think it kind of affects all of us, and uh, I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that, and, you know, especially on uh, SOPA and PIPA. Okay, to address the piracy question specifically, I, I'm inherently against piracy. I, I think that uh, ultimately there isn't much that you can really do to stop it, but that doesn't excuse it. I know people that have been affected by it directly. Uh, and these are are people that that uh, were indie filmmakers. I, I had one guy on my show that that you know recounted an experience you know where he was directly impacted by it. It was none too pleasant, I can tell you that. So I I, I think it is a problem, uh, and I, you know people think of it as only affecting the you know the big name actors and and uh, you know oh, they won't even make a dent in the ten million dollar salaries that so and so is making or the you know umpteen millions that the producers are making. But I mean these are you know regular people that are working on these sets as carpenters and and uh, uh, you know set designers and, and things like that. And there's also a lot of other people that, that aren't making the big bucks that are also getting pinched by this. So I think that it, it, you know something needs to be done to control it, but I don't think that this is the way to go about doing it. Uh, my wife's cousin actually has a uh, an expression that he likes to use, and I don't, I don't want to sound inappropriate by saying this, but he goes, he said, "Don't use a sledgehammer to crack a walnut." And I'm not saying that piracy is something as trivial as a walnut, but you know, the, the message is that this is not necessarily the right tool for the job. I don't think. Yeah, uh, I actually heard it put this way, and I thought this is a, a great analogy of how like SOPA SOPA works. Uh, is there's a guy on YouTube? His name's Total Biscuit. Uh, if if you haven't seen his videos, he's definitely worth uh, checking out. But he he put it this way that SOPA is the the law is basically uh, imagine that somebody has stolen um, has stolen like a piece of jewelry and puts it in their safety deposit box, like in a bank, and uh, you know, the, this law would essentially, in order to stop, you know, to stop that person or to get that piece of jewelry back, you know, instead of just taking that safety deposit box, it shuts down the bank and then all the branches of that bank. So I thought that was kind of a, a cool way to put it. But you know, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of flip flop on, on on piracy because it because it is. It, it can definitely hurt people, but then at the same time, you hear about you know movies and artists that have actually you know their their stuff gets pirated 
tons of times, but because of that piracy, they become known and actually start making tons of money where uh speaking speaking of um you know the the, the whole piracy thing and like filmmakers but on, on the next show we're going to have Lloyd Kaufman on who I know has also been on your show and I I heard him talk about piracy that in a way it's kind of helped trauma because uh I didn't know this but apparently this is true that most of the piracy uh is not actually done in America it's done like in China and stuff like that, and the reason for that is because they don't have access to it, so they have to, you know, pirate it. So it's it, it has kind of worked for some movie companies because everything gets pirated, and then you know when regime, regimes change or laws change, you know, people are finally able to actually get that stuff that they you know weren't able to get otherwise before, and that creates you know a new marketplace for it. So so it it is kind of a weird. You know, kind of slippery slope when you think about piracy, but uh, but of course, you know the, the the whole SOPA and PIPA thing is just a freaking nightmare. And it's it's you know I'm not the biggest fan of Google, but when you have you know Google you know saying that oh this is evil and this could you know destroy the internet, I I tend to believe them, even though you know YouTube and Google definitely uh, are not beyond uh, you know censorship you know themselves, but. Um, Actually, we have a few questions here in the, the chat room. Uh, this is from one of the guests. Um, he wants to know, is there uh, uh, anything that you would like to do or try to do to uh, promote your show or to attract new guests? Is there any, you know, is there any thoughts of, um, I guess that he might be act, asking on behalf of himself, like maybe what, what do you think are the best ways to promote uh, a show or a new show and attract uh, guests and uh, listeners? Okay, well, and that's a good question because I, I am looking at doing different types of things. Uh, one of the things that I really want to start this year is an actual blog. Uh, this is something that I've been somewhat negligent about. I, I have released a few pieces of writing over the course of the last couple of years, and what precious little that I uh, that I was able to put together uh, ultimately was very very well received, and I want to do a little bit more of it. Uh, so that's one of my goals for 2012 is to actually start my own blog. And I, I'm told from people that have done it that, you know, people like writers and other podcasters that if you actually get written stuff out there, first of all, it'll give me an, an excuse, as you alluded to at the top of the show, to actually get my own website, so to speak, even if it is only a WordPress blog, and, and direct people to that and have a link to the talk show feed through that. Uh, so that's something that I'm going to be doing. Uh, another thing that I want to do is to uh, sort of leverage additional resources a little bit more. Uh, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I, certainly I want to do a lot more cross-promotion, uh, just see what else is out there. And I, I ultimately want to start making some actual in-person appearances too. Uh, I noticed that Terry Reed is in the uh, chat room here from Tau X Productions. I've, re I've received a couple of very, very gracious invitations to attend film festivals, and, <laughs> excuse me, places like Flyway in, in uh, Wisconsin and, and uh, uh, Kronos down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. You know, they've graciously extended invitations to me to go down there, and ultimately I, I think that there's no excuse uh, or no substitute, I should say, for in-person meetings, and that is something that I, I would ultimately very much like to do. Oh, uh, here's a question. Um, this is actually something that I've kind of thought about doing, uh, and I've seen other podcasts do this. Have you ever thought about doing, like, any kind of, uh, like, webcam stuff where you actually, you know, uh, you know, actually send out, you know, like a video of you, like, doing the, the podcast, or if you actually get guests on, like, you know, kind of have it spliced where it's you and the guests talking. You ever thought about doing that, or is that something that you're interested in looking into? Personally, I'm a little bit more comfortable with the radio bit, at least for now, but I'm not beyond doing on-camera work if the opportunity arose that I could do it. Uh, another one of the opportunities that I'm looking at, just to give you an idea, is uh, th there's a, um, a TV show on the Internet called Indie TV that I'm a correspondent for, and they want to do a spot on me, at least they did at one point, and uh, I'm, I'm looking at you know finding people that are willing to donate camera time to me. Uh, they have spots on culture and music and, and film, and they're looking at doing a culture spot on me and, you know, allowing me to go on and say my piece and stand on my soapbox about my shows. So ultimately that is something that I'd very, very much like to do. Uh, but, I mean, if people were willing to, you know, offer me opportunities to pop up on 
video webcasts or even for that matter in, in movies or anything like that, then I'd certainly be open to doing that. Let's we'll start maybe trying to wrap this up here a little bit. Um, give uh, give uh, people a little information on how they can get uh, in touch with you or you know where they can listen to the show at. I mean, I, I think you said it's on other places besides TalkShoe. Uh, but give them you know a little information on how maybe they can even get in contact with you if they you know want to be a guest. Sure, by all means. The the easiest way to find me is on Twitter. I'm on there all the time. It's Cutting Room Floor MR, uh, Cutting Room MRB, I should say. So it's Cutting Room MRB uh, on Twitter. Uh,